This show is sponsored by the National Association for Primary Education. Hello, my name is Mark Taylor and welcome to the Education on Fire podcast. The place for creative and inspiring learning from around the world. Listen to teachers, parents and mentors share how they are supporting children to live their best authentic life and are proving to be a guiding light to us all. Hello, welcome back and thank you so much for joining us again on the Education on Fire podcast. Today we're going to be talking about age and how that fits in terms of our school system and how we learn and how it's inherently part of what we understand as we grow up, but also how it's related to the world around us and our social identity moving forward. I'm going to be chatting to Dr. Patrick Alexander from Oxford Brooks University. And he has a book called Schooling and Social Identity, Learning to Act Your Age in Contemporary Britain. And it's a fascinating conversation. And I think you're, you're going to find it very, very interesting as we start to talk about all these implications related to age and our thoughts on that. Now, it seems it's been too long, really, since we've had a one-to-one conversation as a solo episode. We've had some excellent interviews in recent weeks, as well as the bonus episodes. But I just want to spend some time giving you a catch-up, really, of where we are on the Education on Fire journey. So I'm going to do an episode specifically about that this Friday coming up. So do make sure that you subscribe. Make sure that you have access to these latest episodes hitting your, your smartphone as they're released. So just press subscribe on whichever platform that you're using, and then you'll make sure you'll get everything that you need directly as it's released. So this is my conversation with Dr. Patrick Alexander talking about age. Hello, Dr. Patrick Alexander. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Education on Fire podcast. Thanks very much for having me. So let's start with a little bit of background in terms of your professional development, your professional work and and how that's now taken you through to Oxford Brooks University. Uh, yeah, so so a, a bit of a kind of interesting road into education. I think I, I started off um, doing a degree in Latin American studies as an undergrad, um, and so I was really interested in questions about identity. And actually, was my my sort of interest as a younger man was in was in maritime piracy. Um, so uh, so I ended up uh, doing a master's in social anthropology, and again focused on um, on the lives of, of pirates at sea and, and questions about identity and stuff like that. Um, and then took a kind of interesting side road into uh, into doing a, a PGCE. So I trained to be a secondary English teacher. And, and then at the end of that uh, process, kind of transferred a lot of the same conceptual stuff that I was looking at to do with piracy into the world of education. Um, and so I moved on from a, from doing the PGCE onto a doctorate. Um, and at the time, I was thinking, well, should I do a doctorate about pirates or should I do a doctorate about about um, schools and uh, and one seemed to be a little less dangerous than the other, and so um, so I ended up doing um, yeah a doctorate and, and research into um, schooling and, and and socialization in schooling. So my field is um, the anthropology of education. So really interested in questions of how schools socialize us into the into the people that we are. Um, I've worked on a few different smaller projects at, at Oxford University where I was a, a student um, and a, a tutor in anthropology. Um, a few different uh, projects, mostly looking at questions around um, how students are socialized into ideas about aspiration at school, how they start to think about what they might do with their lives through schooling. Um, and then that led me on to a job at Oxford Brooks, where I started as, a, as an early career research fellow um, and, again, was carrying on the, the work that I've, that I've been doing for about 10 years now, um, looking at uh, schooling and socialization. Um, that led me to do a, a Fulbright scholarship um, at New York University. Um, so I spent a year in New York doing research in a big public high school, and my focus there was on understanding how young people are socialized into imagining the future at school. So how are schools kind of engines for thinking about the future? Um, and then after that, I, I came back to Brooks, um, and I've been there ever since, um, helping to develop um, research and uh, kind of research-informed professional learning activity in the School of Education at Oxford Brooks, um, where now I'm the research lead for the school and also a reader in, in uh, education. Well, in a nutshell, that's me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and and you can see why well, this is a great fit in terms of, you know, education on fire is about creative and inspiring learning that's going on around the world. And um, and so I'm, I'm really interested as we start to talk a little bit about your book, Schooling and Social Identity, because I think we're going to have some really interesting insights about that. But I just wanted to touch back on the on the idea of the pirates and everything, because that 
like I can understand, like you say, when you were going through studying, you know, which angle to go for and which path <laughs> to go for. But in lots of ways with children, it, they go hand in hand, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it was um, it was around about uh, 2004 or five when there was the, the large tsunami in Southeast Asia. And so I, I, I really did have quite a, a thought out plan for how I was going to go off and do this research with with pirates in Southeast Asia, where at the time that was the kind of the big focus for, for sort of piratical activity. Um, and then the, the tsunami kind of disrupted their lives in a major way. Um, and so the, the kind of field, the field site wasn't there anymore. Um, and so, you know, very practically, I sort of moved on to, to other things. Um, and uh, yeah, but but genuinely, there are lots of crossovers in terms of the in terms of these big questions about identity that I was looking at. So you know, on one hand, I was thinking, well, how is identity shaped in different ways at sea, where you're kind of um, you're not bound in the same ways that you are on land by certain things. Um, and if you look back to the kind of golden age of piracy, there's lots of interesting stuff about gender fluidity and um, questions about sexuality and, and um, you know, political views and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so really flipping that same question on its head, I then went into schools and thought, OK, well, how are these same big philosophical things shaped in the day to day of, of school life? And yeah, people often joke and say, well, you chose the more dangerous of the two. Right? The <laughs> secondary school playground is uh, can be a, a perilous place to be. But yeah, maybe maybe not quite so bad as uh, the bow of a pirate ship. And and how did the book come about? I mean, it sounds like it's um, a natural progression from all the studying and all the all the work that you were doing. Was was there was, was it like that? Was it as seamless as that seems? Uh, yeah, I mean, I th- the book really came about um, when I was training. So, so the book focuses essentially on um, the idea that uh, that schools are the, one of the fundamental places in society where we're socialized into ideas about age as an important category of who we are. Um, so where we where we start to think about age as almost like a taken for granted um, benchmark that we can measure ourselves against and, and kind of imagine our lives through. So thinking, well, I'm this age, so I should be doing this, or I'm this age in relation to that person, and so our relationship should be just, should be kind of constructed in a particular way. Um, and really, I got into that as a theme through training to be a teacher. So I was, um, you know, I was in my early 20s. I think I was 23 when I trained to be a teacher. And probably like a lot of a lot of, um, you know, young people um, training to be a teacher, uh, I kind of went into the, to the classroom and, you know, after a week or two, was kind of amazed that these kids were taking me seriously um, because I thought, well, I'm barely I'm barely grown myself. You know, I'm barely an adult. Um, and so I was in classrooms sort of performing adulthood, if you like, you know, uh, grew a beard, all those kind of cliches of, of what you know maybe a, a young male teacher does to try and look the part, um, you know, wearing a suit, and and so it, it started to get me thinking about you know what what is the significance of age in schools, um, not only for 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 young people but also for for younger teachers. How 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 is this constructed in um, quite a complex way? So you know from the from a kind of the from a bird's eye view, the assumption is that age happens in very kind of neat stages you know that we we get older and that our competencies um, develop and um, you know the kinds of uh, interactions that we have with people change depending on how we how we kind of progress through the different stages of life but as we all know actually the reality of that is extremely complex and and kind of extremely fascinating and so um, yeah that's that's really how I got into it you know having that experience but also talking to a lot of younger teachers who you know would be acting the part of the teacher in the classroom but in the staff room would be complaining that you know their mum hadn't made them a very good packed lunch or um you know talking about bumping into six formers in a in a club at the weekend that kind of stuff so so that's really what, what got me interested in it um and and yeah then led me onto these these bigger questions that i explore in the book about um about age and society age and, and imagining the future yeah so t- take us into that a little bit tell what does it explore exactly and how um and, and what are sort of some of the things that you found out yeah, so so I mean, the the, the book really that the kind of central argument is that age is one of the last grand narratives, if you like, of modern society. So if you think about it, you know, in lots of different ways, um, in the last fifty to sixty years, social scientists and and the wider public have come have become quite kind of accustomed to the idea that we can break down lots of other markers of identity. So things like class, gender, ethnicity, race. Um, you know, that a lot of uh, academic work, a lot of public discussion has gone into showing how, you know, those those aren't essential categories. They're, they're categories that are constructed in society um, and they're categories that can change, uh, you know, over our lifetime. So, you know, 
Um, the sociologist Anthony Giddens famously talked about this kind of process of of a kind of individualization of identity. So, you know, it's not like um, it may have been in the mid 20th century where if you were born working class, you would, you know, you would kind of become working class and die working class. That obviously society gets more complex than that. And you might identify as being working class, but you might be socially mobile and economic terms. You know, all, all those kinds of things can happen in a person's life. And obviously, um, it, more contemporaneously, the discussions around um, around sex and gender, sexuality, we're becoming more accustomed to to the idea that that's a, that's a kind of fluid spectrum, and that people can um, you know can move and change through different points of identification with with sex and gender. But age, interestingly, actually hasn't really been challenged as a framework for thinking about identity. It's almost so taken for granted. That um, that we that we don't stop to think. Well, why is it that we haven't thought to kind of deconstruct the different categories that age is organised by? Um, and by that I mean that you know we all think that um, you know we're born, we're children, um, we're socialised into particular ideas. We go to school, we move through year groups, um, and we start to identify with other people that are the same age as us. Um, and then we might start to imagine ourselves at future ages down the line and imagine certain things that we might do with our lives. And slowly but surely, we're, we're socialized into thinking about uh, the kind of a linear process through that, through that um, you know, the progression, the chronological progression or a progression through year groups, whatever it may be, um, to the point where, where we don't really um, we don't really stop and think, well, why is it that we that everything is organized according to age? And specifically, why is it that schools are organized according to age? And my argument is that is that um, you know the, the age-based structure of of schooling is really really important to the broader structure of modern society because it's through schooling that we're socialized into thinking about things like citizenship being age-based, we're socialized into um, thinking about uh, legal statuses in relation to age, we're socialized into thinking about intelligence in relation to age. Um, and, and all of those all of those things start to, to kind of form and come together in schools in a way that really hasn't changed since the since the 19th century, since mass education really started to take hold um, in the UK and then, you know, around the world. So ultimately, in the book, I, I kind of come to the to the to the argument that um, in spite of the amazing amount of change that's happened in the in the last hundred years, that age-based structure of schooling in, in England hasn't changed at all. And so the, the really important question is, is to ask is why? Why is it so important that we school people um, in, according to uh, the kind of broad you know, age bands that we have in, in, in the vast majority of, of English uh, primary and secondary schools? Um, and, and really, my argument is that that, that that structure is so important for the rest of the modern nation state that it's very, very difficult to, to get rid of. So if you get rid of age as a structure, an organizing structure in schools, then there are other institutions in society that might start to kind of crack or, or, or kind of, you know, um, uh, come apart at the seams because um, schooling is really where those ideas are, are kind of established, formulated, and then become taken for granted But for all of us. You know, we all think about ourselves in relation to the generations that we became part of when we were at school. And I guess there are pros and cons to that in as much as we identify with it. Like you say, it takes us into our into into life after school as well and, and other establishments and different parts of uh, of society. Do you think that's holding us back in terms of it, if we did it differently, you know, if we had multi-age classes and, and more of a, a community feel within a school it would benefit or it would hinder or is it just stuck there because the prospect of it changing other aspects of our lives is just too too far to, to fathom? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we. It, it's interesting to think a bit about it on kind of three different levels. So on one level, you can think about it in terms of the, the broader structure of societies, as I've already mentioned. So I think one of the reasons why we haven't moved away from that is because, as, I, as I've said, it, age is such an important part of the of the broader structure of society. Another thing we might think about is that we we live in a society that um, the anthropologist David Lancey describes as a gerontocracy. So the idea that you know we live in a society that's organised about around the power of older people over younger people. 
um, the elders uh, should be the people who hold status and hold power, and therefore they're also the people who um, get to decide what kinds of knowledge young people have access to, what pace they're able, they're allowed to develop uh, at, what kinds of rites of passage, like exams, they need to pass through in order to gain new statuses, that kind of thing. So moving away from an age-based structure of, of mass education challenges that gerontocracy, that age-based hierarchy. So that's level two. And then level three, the thing that I think is, is kind of deeply interesting is what that tells us about how we think about knowledge in schools. So um, often, you know, traditionally schools have been places, you know, the, the verb to school means to discipline, to make tractable, that they're places where um, it's assumed that you know, older, wiser people have knowledge and they hand it down to younger people. And of course, that's a, that's a crude generalization about what happens in schools. Obviously, these, these days, um, practice is a lot more complex than that. Um, but but that, that approach, the idea that teachers have knowledge and, and children accept knowledge, um, suggests that suggests something quite interesting about how knowledge works. It suggests that you know there is a, a kind of a thing that is knowledge and that, that old people have it, that's why they have their status, and they pass it on to young people. Whereas a different view of knowledge one um, that, that goes right back to people like Dewey as a, a you know philosopher of education would so you know th th that traditional one is about transfer right about transfer from older to younger people whereas Dewey uh, talked about transmission the idea that knowledge actually happens between young people and older people in that kind of in the, in the action of, of learning and that's something that I think is probably you know that's at the heart of a kind of child-centered approach to learning and something that most teachers I think uh, are engaged in in an everyday way but but the structure of schooling doesn't actually um, doesn't actually mirror that kind of a that kind of a commoning of knowledge a kind of a commoning of knowledge knowledge coming together between people um, so, so that's the third reason why I don't think we've got rid of this um, this age-based structure is because really if you do that, it opens us up to very interesting new ways of thinking about what knowledge actually is. And I think for me, the oh well, I'll ask I'll ask you specifically. Do do you think there's a halfway house? Because the thing that strikes me, first of all, is the fact that I definitely identify with the fact, um, and even till you know relatively recently in my life, that if someone is older than you, therefore they do have more experience and they have more knowledge and should be respected but also are wise in, in in a way just purely because like you say there's that age difference and it's taken me quite a long time into my adulthood to realize that actually people who are older are sometimes just older not necessarily wiser <laughs> um but but that i can understand how that's a little bit ingrained um purely from all those things that you've said now yeah and i think that, that i mean you know we've talked about it in kind of in terms of the the big picture um, theoretical perspective, but but you're right. It's 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 something that's quite simple to think about when you when you think about personal experience. So if you think about um, you know people who uh, sort of were in their early adult years in the 60s and 70s, probably their relationship with their parents um, was that their parents were kind of you know people who you should be you know who you should be deferential to, people who you should respect. Um, things like divorce were much rarer. Um, and so, you know, your, your perception of an older generation was was maybe a lot more um, coherent, whereas from the 70s, we see the rate of divorce going up. We see a kind of 60s and 70s counterculture, um, you know, that that kind of um, that kind of uh, perfect image of what adults stable adulthood looks like starts to erode. And that's a good thing because it's, you know, it reflects the reality of of human life. Um, but it, but it is hard to get away from that idea that you should simply respect people because they're older. Um, and I think if we look into the uh, into the kind of the, the broader movement of the youth quake, that kind of um, you know, so-called youth quake that that changed the the nature the, the shape of uh, politics in the UK in the last five to six years, or you look at something like the the kind of new uh, you know sort of environmental movement around focusing around people like Greta Thunberg, or you look at the political um, movement in Hong Kong at the moment or the move against um, the Second Amendment in the United States, all of those movements are led by people who are very young. And so I think one of the things that makes those each of those movements so challenging to, to an establishment is that they are challenging the fundamentals of a gerontocracy. They're saying, I'm 16, and I have just as much right to to say something on this. And in fact, I seem to be saying the more sensible thing than somebody who's three times my age. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I think... For me, um, the, the climate 
um, and environment issue is a big one because there is a real sense now that you know time is running out or if things are going to be done they need to happen now and I think the younger generation younger generation coming through a really understanding you know this is my world that I'm going to be inhabiting and I want it to look different and if I want it to look different then it needs to happen now and if you're not listening to me I'm going to make sure that you hear me like you say that there's there is that sort of rallying cry that actually we're able to make a difference I guess because of the way technology is and social media and the fact that it, we are a global world in in the true sense now that people start to hear all of those things and and also there is a sense of i can have my voice and and there, there is no sort of repercussions or in in the way that there might have been like you say just a generation or so ago yeah absolutely and i mean i think the you know the point about about you know what's what are the major changes in the last 10 years one would be obviously the kind of the the social media revolution the way that smartphone technology has changed and also um, growing up after the financial crisis if you think about what it means to be young now and to have lived in a world where you're not only a consumer but you're also a producer of of, of media um, where you've seen on a large scale the failure of capitalism um, and yet you've also gone to school and uh, in in the bigger picture, have been socialized into imagining a very li- you know still a very linear way of thinking about the future. So you know the idea that you you work hard today in order to anticipate um, some kind of reward tomorrow. You do your exam so that you can get into university to get a job. You know that that sort of traditional linear view of the future. And yet these young people are also living in a world that is extremely uncertain. Obviously, our, our current situation, um, the the current context of coronavirus really shows that, you know, the idea that someone can be working their entire life towards an exam that then ceases to exist and they get to pass anyway. You know, that kind of profound uncertainty really troubles the model that schooling up until now has really has presented this idea that you go through stages, you work hard and that tomorrow something will be there that you can anticipate today. And really the the future, uh, the future ain't what it used to be. (laughs) It's not as, it's not as, um, it's not as simple as a kind of modernist picture of the future would, would have us believe. And so that's where I conclude the book. Really. I say, you know, will, will the nature of school schooling change in terms of the the age-based structure of schooling? And this was pre coronavirus. So actually I might, (laughs) if I could, I might adjust the conclusion slightly. Um, Maybe it won't because the, the, the importance of those age-based structures is, is so profound, but students will move, young people will move with their feet. And it's no, it's no coincidence that people like Greta Thunberg frame their resistance against the current uh, sort of environmental context by doing school walkouts. So leaving school is an important part of it's, it's, um, you know, making a claim to power that is uncoupled from age, I think. And the age within the school system, I mean, do you see a way, I think this is what I was, I was starting to think about before I moved myself on uh, earlier on, um, in terms of sort of having different ages within not just a continual classroom but that kind of peer-to-peer within a few age um a few years different age group can be very beneficial in lots of ways as well but also i guess then if you're doing some kind of project-led work where everyone brings something different to the table because you've got a different perspective within those different age groups I can understand how that would be a very positive thing because what that would then do was, like you say, it doesn't put everything off to the fact that I can do X when I'm this age or that age tomorrow, the year after. And I think anything that then brings everything back into the present is has a very um, positive connotation. And also from a sort of a, um, a mental health point of view, there, there seems to be a, a, a lot of um, sort of evidence at the minute that actually being present and feeling like everything is important now rather than in the future is a really good way for us to be thinking absolutely and i mean i think you know obviously there are um you know questions around safeguarding there are questions around um you know what what kinds of limits on on interaction you might you might put into place um related to age but what you're describing i think fits into a, a longer trajectory of you know what's often described as kind of you know democratic education or um you know alternative approaches to education where 
age is not the thing is not the is not the uh, is not the hat stand. Um, you know that the, if you if you remove those age categories, then absolutely you could suggest. So let's say, for example, in our current situation where people are working online, does it make sense to get year seven together anymore? Could you not put stuff online? that focuses on a particular skill or a particular, um, you know, project based theme, like you said, and then have people of all different kinds of ages participate in that work. Um, and for their, their capacity to be the thing that, that leads the level that they work at rather than their age. Um, and so, so absolutely, I think that's a, that's a, that would be an interesting thing to explore. How would that change the nature of, schooling if we were to start to move away from a rigid age-based approach to organization uh, organizing schools um you know in lots of countries around the world that the idea of progressing inevitably through year groups doesn't um, exist in the same way as it does in england so you know in somewhere like spain um that you, you do a test at the end of every year to see if you can progress which obviously in lots of ways actually further ingrains the idea of an age-based um, understanding of intelligence or capacity um, or places like the US where the same thing would happen that you know you can remain in the same year um, for for years and years and so you can be so for example in the school where I was doing research in New York City you could have seniors who are 17 but you could also have seniors who are 21 and in this particular school some seniors who'd been to prison and come back to school um, so there are you know there are there are complications to it but I think there's a, there's a huge amount of potential especially in this moment to explore how we might move schooling on. So, you know, schooling really still does reflect um, ideas that emerged at the end of the 19th century and in the early 20th century in, in, in Britain. And I think, you know, we're, we're at a really crucial moment where we might be able to think really creatively and positively about what schooling could be beyond its current model. And I guess that the idea of knowledge itself is a really interesting one because like you say, with smartphones and the fact that you have large amounts of knowledge at your fingertips, that actually some of these other skills in terms of working together, in terms of understanding relationships, in terms of being able to deal with different personalities and in, in how we support each other to, to, to get on, let, let alone just be working together as well. I guess as soon as these things become much more tradable um, from a workforce point of view or, or, or where people start to really see these as, as really more valuable than just the ability to understand that you have an A-level in this or a GCSE in this or a degree in this, um, I, I don't know where that kind of starts to move and when it starts to change because like you say, we are so ingrained at the minute. But I wonder whether, you know, like say with the current situation we're in at the moment with the coronavirus and, and the whole globe looking at, at everything different and, and school literally having to change overnight, it may be actually it's these sorts of unprecedented things which actually just start to tilt, st tilt the tables slightly differently and show us a new way. Yeah, and I mean, I think, that, you know, that you're, you, you're mentioning mental health before is in, in, and well-being is a, is a really interesting angle to explore it from. I mean, I think one of the hard things that comes with schooling being organized as it is, um, is that it fits into a wider, a wider pattern in society that um, some people have described, so the, the, um, the American author Lauren Ballant has described as cruel optimism. The idea that, you know, through schooling, but also in university and in wider life, we're socialized into this message that we can do whatever we want if we only try hard, um, or that if we, you know, if we just but if we just knuckle down, um, we'll be able to achieve that particular thing that we that we want to achieve. But actually, for a lot of people, um, you know, for structural reasons, that might not be true, right? So there might be there might be structural factors that are stacked against you that are going to make it much more difficult for you to achieve certain things than for other people. Um, you know, th so thinking about that, you know, the, the myth of a meritocracy that's presented in education, um, where you know we we live in in societies that are demonstrably unequal and therefore provide unequal access to particular things in the future. Um, so you know, so so we get, and this is true not only for people in in positions of disadvantage, but for people in positions of of great advantage as well. That we're we're socialized uh, in lots in lots of different ways through schooling 
to aspire to certain things, to try and do well in X and Y and Z. And particularly for people who have come, you know, who, who are coming into adulthood in the 10 years since the last financial crash, they're living in a world where they're seeing regular evidence that all that hard work doesn't actually amount to the thing that's been promised. That doing a university degree doesn't mean that you might you might get the job that you want to. You might not even know what that job is. Um, that doing a university degree will, will actually create a huge amount of debt for you and, and greater uncertainty um, that you might not know the reality of the job that you've been that you that you think you might want to do in the future um, that, that graduating high school or getting a levels might not have the same value that it, that it did 10 20 30 years ago um, so presented with all of this uncertainty um, young people are still having to go to school every day and live a kind of double life where on one hand they're they're living in uncertain times and on the other hand they're they're experiencing a structure that encourages them to be future oriented in a very very linear way to imagine a single version of themselves traveling through time towards particular goals and so at a quite a profound level that's that's damaging because because the the vast majority of people won't succeed in those goals. That's the kind of that's the that's the simple logic of of neoliberalism, right? That that's if you want to succeed, it has to be as as a result of the failure of many other people. There can be only one person that succeeds in a particular in a particular you know thing when you when you've got that kind of a zero sum model. Um, so so that can be you know in terms of mental health, that can be really hard because so many of us. Don't ever feel like we're getting where we where we wanted to get to, which is a very long way of saying, okay, so if we try and get rid of that structure, how else might we start to structure how to organize education in a way that tries to remove a bit of that pressure? So let's say you don't have to go to university straight after school and you don't have to go straight from university to work. You could work and go to university or you could go to university when you're 40, when you when you have a, set, a better sense of, of what you'd like to study or to even think about completely getting rid of the barrier between secondary education and university. If anything, we see now that there's a there's a real gap in terms of what happens in schools and what happens in universities. Maybe we could bridge that gap. And taking age out of the picture opens up so many opportunities for doing that. And, and as you said, the current situation, you know, which is obviously unfortunate in, in you know, 99.9% of its different manifestations, does offer a potential to, to radically shift the structure of schooling to, to you know, open some of those doors. And I, and I think also, once you also have that slightly different mindset that even getting a job in inverted commas is is going to be something that you're going to achieve that so many people now having especially working online you know being able to create an income online from selling courses from selling their ideas by uh, just actually playing Fortnite. <laughs> well, absolutely <laughs> yeah exactly it can be it can be some from like i say you know from the youtubers and, and the gamers all the way through to just the fact that you don't go to the office you don't actually have to work for someone else you it's the it's exactly the uniqueness of who you are and the skills that you've picked up and, and the understanding that you have of yourself which becomes valuable rather than just like you say the actual qualification that you may have and and I, and you can start to then see how those pools in different directions are going to be well, you can see how, the, like we said, the, the mental health issues start to come because you, what you understand and what you feel in one direction is different from what you, what you're being told all the time. And I certainly, from a from a, an earlier year sort of standpoint, always start to think about the idea that you know we don't actually have to teach very young children how to grow and learn they do it instinctually they know what they want to do they know what they like they know how to go about it in their best ways as adults and as teachers in those young years we just need to have the experience to keep them safe and to frame everything in a way that supports them and it does seem to me that schooling as we start to go through starts to take that out and there's a whole bigger debate then about the testing scenario and all of that kind of thing but if we just had like you said about that kind of bigger area that we could all just develop into and we get rid of some of these barriers in terms of primary to secondary school secondary to to um, universities and college and we just think about how we learn and we grow in a way that's rounded in a way that does all of these different things almost within I'm almost thinking like within a sort of a, of a bowl kind of idea you know we all want a level of understanding and learning which is important for us to be able to communicate and to get on 
but then we actually have the ability to pick and choose the things which really will support us to achieve our potential and at that point then anything feels like it's possible and like you say then it doesn't matter about age and and all of these other things because you can grab what you need you can surround yourself with the people that you want to at any given moment at any given time and then like you say the age thing becomes much less of an issue because it's it's there at your fingertips as long as you know what it is that you're after and I think you know you've you've hit on a really important thing there uh, around you know not just blurring the lines between different phases of education, but looking at education as a kind of a, you know as a right you know as a, as a lifelong thing that we should all be able to engage in, and not to think oh well you know those were my halcyon uni years <laughs> where I felt like I got to you know read some interesting books and and now I'm on the mill. Um, you know that we should all be we should all have that opportunity to to keep thinking and 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 keep learning and feel like we're flourishing in a way that it that, that really does um, help people to feel positive about their lives. And you know one of the one of the big questions that I've asked in my research um, that I ask in this book and, and in future research is you know the simple question: What's the meaning of life? <laughs> Which is to say, um, you know, how is it that we're socialized into thinking that certain things are meaningful and other things are less meaningful? And, you know, that happens in a really, really subtle way in the everyday of schooling. And, and like you said before, um, you know, schools are f- profoundly future oriented in the in the way that they're structured at the moment, because everything you're doing is about some kind of future milestone that you're going to you're going to hit that anticipates some other future milestone. And interestingly, so many of those of that so many components of that future are, are really a kind of picture of the future that was imagined in the in the 1950s. And it didn't even exist in the 50s. <laughs> you know, the, the, we're, we're all imagining a future that's 70 years old and didn't actually come to pass anyway. You know, the kind of the 2.5 kids, the permanent job for life, all of those kinds of things that, you know, was a historical anomaly for, for some people in one generation. But we're all still anticipating that as some, some kind of future thing. Um, so if we if we try and step back from that, um, you know, that kind of that, that process of imagining a, a straightforward future. Yeah, loads of different doors open. And, you know, if you think we're, we're living in a we're living in a in a in a in an aging population where there's less and less intergenerational uh, interaction, um, it, it makes absolute sense to me that you should that we should be thinking about education in a way that that um, incorporates um, a, a lot more older people who obviously have a huge amount of experience and expertise to share, but who also might want to continue to learn things, uh, you know, to go back to A-level biology or or whatever it may be. Um, You know, once you take a few steps back, there is no reason why we should continue to to kind of compartmentalise education in the way that we are. And I think just to to start to sort of round off the whole conversation about that, the other thing I find interesting is the fact that you can argue or you can understand the reason for keeping education where it was because it needs to service a world that we need to keep going. But I think the one thing that we're all beginning to realise is that we don't want to keep the world going in the same direction because it's not really working for everybody anyway. If, if you think even if from a purely sort of business sense, you know, the big companies, the big organizations that are incredibly successful, especially the ones that have come out of this new technology era, you know, the Googles and the Apples of this world, they actually function as a business, as a group of people very differently than what was an older school company. Um, And so we're not even sort of creating an environment within our school system to support what we know is being popular in that kind of sort of capitalist kind of way um anyway you know so even then it doesn't really make sense to continue the same structures that we were doing before no absolutely and i mean i think you know you're 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 absolutely right that you know if you if you go back through policy documents um around the development of, of mass education in england you know, there is a large explicit message about schools being where capital is developed, you know, human capital. Um, and so absolutely, in the last 50 years, we've seen the nature of work change in lots of different ways. Um, and, and I definitely don't want to suggest that schools, you know, that, that, that teachers and pupils in schools aren't adapting to that new reality. I think in the, in the everyday of schools, um, young people and teachers interact in a way that's that's really complex and that and that kind of anticipates a lot of the issues we've been talking about and in the book i use this concept of age imaginaries as a way of articulating how age actually works in day-to-day life so one example is you know a a year seven uh pdc you know personal development curriculum lesson where the teacher is saying okay boys and girls we're going to look at um different charities and so the 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 
you know, 11 year olds in this class respond to the teacher by acting like children because they're, 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 they're seeing that as part of the performance, what's going on. Um, and then the, you know, the explicit learning objective of the class is to act in a mature way. So actually at the same time as being expected to act like children, they're also expected to act like they're growing up. And then while the teacher wasn't looking, they were looking at all kinds of stuff on Google Images that was adult in its content, right? So they're playing with multiple different imaginings of age all at the same time. And I saw this all the way through the the, the school that I was doing the researching. Um, so that happens as much as it does with year sevens as it does with teachers. So, you know, you've got teachers who are performing age um, so in some cases, younger teachers who were acting a bit more disciplinarian because they thought that would make them seem older to the to the students who they might have only been chronologically a few years older than. Um, and then at the same time, you've got this really interesting thing where you've got year 11s who've seen five years of trainee teachers who are really sage about this performance that they're seeing. And they're saying, oh, well, don't worry, they've got a lot to learn still, you know, they'll get there, they'll get there. Um, and, and, you know, because they've seen so many trainee teachers, so many young teachers trying to act old, they're actually the sage ones who've got this kind of complex vision of what, um, of what age looks like. So I think this is actually happening all the time in schools, but the real tension is that that practice rubs uncomfortably against the structure of schooling, which, uh, as I mentioned, hasn't really changed at all um, to, to a large extent for, for over 100 years. It's really pretty much as it was um, back in the in the 1880s, um, or at least you know back in the you know, so-called sort of Fordist model, these kind of you know, factory model of schooling that, that that pushes us through different year groups as we develop different skills, and then out we go into the world. Um, and, and absolutely, we're in a moment where we can really radically think about how schooling might be different for the future. So let's just finish off in terms of talking about how the book is actually structured in terms of how all these things fit in and and also then we can talk about exactly where people can get hold of it yeah absolutely so so the book kicks off really by asking that that big question why is it that we organize schooling according to age so i do a kind of dive into the into the history of that what ideas emerged in the 19th and 20th centuries uh, partly from psychology but from other disciplines to to start to fix our idea about age in certain ways um, and then I present this this concept of age imaginaries as as maybe one way that we can start to think about age in a in a complex way that's that's kind of layered. Um, I look at the the history of schooling in in the UK. So ask you know at what point did we start to to um, design schools according to year groups essentially? So why is that the way that most schools have become organised? Um, and then I dive into the detail of the one particular school that I did my research in. So I look first at um, how age is imagined in the classroom. So I look at the interactions between teachers and students. Um, I look at the interactions in, in relation to the curriculum, how uh, in different classroom settings, uh, kids are able to kind of perform age um, in response to their teachers' reactions to them. So one teacher described that as the kind of the gaps in the day, you know, when you've taught year seven and you've had your kind of year seven hat on and then you have about two minutes to adjust and then be teaching year 10. Um, and then from the kids' side, they had this really fascinating way of describing, you know, how you would go through the day and you would have a very complex understanding of how if you're in year 10, let's say, each teacher judges you in a particular way based on what their assumption is about how year 10 should act. And so they all joked about how, you know, the beginning of every year, teachers would say, come on now, you're in year 10, you've got to knuckle down and you're in year 11. And the message was kind of repeated every year. Um, so I look at the classroom, um, then I look at the at the playground. So I look at the kind of informal ways in which uh, social life at school for kids is organized around age. So things like, you know, at break, who controls which parts of the playground? How does that change over the years? What are the unwritten rules about who can um, socialize with who, who can be romantic with who across the different year groups? Um, and in that section, I think an interesting thing that comes out is, is a kind of um, a class-based tension in the school where there are middle-class kids, uh, you know, to put it crudely, who revert to a kind of traditional idea about age um, because they feel like there are, um, you know, working-class kids in the school who are encroaching on their on their status, on their age-based status. So they 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 go back to these ideas about hoodies and about um, you know so-called chavs and things like that to try and make sense of why that the age-based structure of the of the informal interactions between kids is is kind of under threat in the school. And then last but not least, I go to the staff room and I ask the question, how is age imagined between different teachers in the staff room? 
And so this becomes um, an exploration both of how younger and older teachers interact with each other. So you've got, for example, newly qualified teachers who might be the same age as the children of other teachers or even the grandchildren of some teachers. Um, and then you've got uh, younger teachers interacting with older students um, and trying to make sense of their relationships with them, that kind of tension between do you try and perform a more adult role or do you kind of try to present yourself as, as being cooler because you're young, <laughs> which in my experience never works. Um, but um, so it's, it's the story of how young teachers get to grips with imagining age as a kind of fundamental part of their professional role. And then I kind of wrap up by by um, raising some of those questions that we've that we've talked about today. You know, what's what's next for schooling, um, and if schooling doesn't change, will young people make that change happen themselves? It, it's an absolutely fascinating conversation, and and thank you so much for coming on and sharing it with us. Just leave us with the name of the book again, and where people can get hold of it, and exactly where they can find out more about you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so the book is called Schooling and Social Identity, Learning to Act Your Age in Contemporary Britain. Um, and it was out in February 2020 with Palgrave Macmillan. So if you if you Google that or Google my name, hopefully that will come up. My website is uh, patrickgalexander.org um, or you can find me on the Oxford Brooks uh, website. And I'm very happy to talk to, to schools and teachers about these issues, which uh, I'm really passionate about and that, uh, that get me out of bed every day. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for spending the time with us and, and exploring it in so much detail. And um, I hope many people get the chance to to dive in and, and learn more through your book as well. And uh, look forward to being able to have the opportunity to continue this conversation another time soon. That sounds good. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Education on Fire podcast. For more information of each episode and to get in touch, go to educationonfire.com. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. I'd like to thank the National Association for Primary Education for their continued support and sponsorship of this show. NAEP are currently supporting teachers by producing fortnightly videos which cover themes like art, school trips and literacy. Also, they are giving away e-copies of their professionally produced journal, Primary First. To find out more about the association, please go to nape.org.uk. That's N-A-P-E dot org dot uk